Welcome everyone to this online symposium on art and humanity, what is possible. My name is Philippe Stoll, I am the Senior Communication Advisor for the International Committee of the Red Cross. Today is the fourth and last session of a symposium which has seen a number of leading experts discussing and debating on this fascinating topic. This time we will have four pre-recorded sessions and, of course, a very lively Q&A session at the end. So please keep your question or post your question on the chat box. I can guarantee that it's going to be a very interesting and exciting session as we are going to explore the question of impacting. First, we'll be joined by Afshan Oyer, who is the museum uh, liaison and evaluation expert at the EPFL in Lausanne. In her paper, she questions how art can be a vector for change. We will then listen to Paula Forgione, who is a healthcare in danger delegate at the International Committee of the Red Cross. In her paper, she will present the humanitarian worker's perspective on how she collaborates with artists. After that, Luis Carlos Tovar will share with us his creative process to address the humanitarian situation. He is a visual artist based in France and Colombia. And finally, the closing remarks will be done by Katarzyna Gratzka. She is a visiting professor at the University of Neuchâtel and senior researcher, Peace Research Institute in Oslo. And don't forget that today, this is your last chance to participate to a co-creation of an artwork with Swiss-based artist Gilles Fourfangler. He will join us for a 10-minute session. The artwork will consist of a co-authored text, which will be published later this year in the symposium's paper. Gilles Fourfangler's work focuses on reading, writing, performances, as well as painting and graphic arts. He has had numerous exhibitions in Switzerland and around the world. He works with Skopje Gallery in Geneva. Before we get started, I would like to sincerely thank all my partners in crime. Julie enkel juliard the Head of Cultural Development of the Ashera Day in Geneva, and Pascal Urschmidt, the Director of the International Red Cross Red Crescent Museum. I'd like also to thank Pierre-Antoine Possa from the museum who helped us for the coordination and the production of the symposium. The symposium is the result of a collaboration between the International Red Cross Red Crescent Museum, the HEAD in Geneva, the Red Cross of Geneva and the International Committee of the Red Cross. We would like to sincerely thank all the partners for their enthusiastic support. It is time now to begin. Please use the chat box for your question, participate in Gilles Fourvangler's artwork, and enjoy the symposium. Hello, I'm Dr. Afshan Hoyer. I'm a museologist and education expert. Today, I want to talk to you about the art of transformation. My talk will focus on the core of the experience of looking at art, what shapes the perceptions, interpretations, and meaning-making processes of the viewer, and how this can be turned into both an active and transformative learning experience. I will include examples from my research and practice working directly with museum goers as participants. Can art be a vector for change? What if people's connections with art could encourage positive change in perceptions, beliefs, and even society? Through engagement, critical reflection, dialogue, and transformative learning, it is possible. I begin with two basic questions. Can art trigger a transformative learning process and do transformative learning experiences happen in the museum? My research and practice in various museums and in different cultural projects has shown that the answer is yes. Now let's address the nature of museum objects and meaning making. Objects are polysemic. Museums present objects, artifacts and works of art for the public who in turn observe them, reflect 
and make meaning. Museums will often focus on presenting the significance of the object, its context, history, and meaning. The polysemic nature of objects is important as this allows the viewer to see and feel different things while viewing the same object, as well as to construct multiple meanings. Here's an example from the Red Cross and uh, Red Crescent Museum collections. We have a cup. We see a utilitarian object, a mass produced aluminum cup used to drink from. However, let us not forget, this is a museum object and it is part of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Museum collections. Why? This cup tells a story. The cup is from Iraq, dating from the period 1985 to 1990. The historical context of the cup and its intended use evokes war, notably the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. As Paul Bouvier states in his article, uh, Prisoners' Objects, Art, Communication and Humanity, in extremely harsh detention conditions where prisoners suffer from abandonment, isolation, deprivation, violence, and degrading treatment. An object or an artistic or intellectual activity can restore their dignity and assure their survival as human beings. This particular cup also has a personal story. This Iraqi army cup was engraved by an Iranian prisoner of war and given to the delegate helping him to return to his home country. Suddenly, this object can be seen to represent human suffering as well as a release from suffering, becoming a symbol of survival and human dignity, as well as a gesture of gratitude. I'm showing you this cup today to display how intention and or intended use is different from associated stories or meanings. Elaine Hoyman Gurian explains that the meaning of an object in an exhibition can sometimes come from the associated story or associated history. She uses the example of a bowl, an object manufactured in huge quantities, a bowl that can be bought in any shop may not seem to be very significant. But if the label informs the museum visitor that this bowl comes from Auschwitz, the visitor automatically transfers their knowledge of the Holocaust to the object. Thus, the story of an object may be of fundamental importance in the object's meaning. Now, moving forward, let's keep in mind that we are talking about objects or artworks that are displayed in a certain context, the museum, within which individuals search for meaning when they are viewing them and the vital importance of stories or associated meanings. Now, to focus on the art of transformation, I will attempt to answer three further questions by delving into research as well as methodology that I've used within specific cultural projects working directly with museum goers, or as I prefer to say, with participants as individual actors within meaning making processes. So first, what is transformative learning? Next, how does transformative learning occur? And how do we foster these experiences? So what is transformative learning? Studying the reactions of women re-entering community college programs in the 1970s, Jack Mesereau outlined transformational learning. Transformative learning is a theory of adult learning that utilizes disorienting dilemmas to challenge participants' thinking. Individuals are then encouraged to use critical thinking and questioning to consider if their underlying assumptions and beliefs about the world are accurate. Transformative learning theory, considered a subset of constructivism, serves to explain the learning process of constructing and appropriating new and revised interpretations of the meaning of an experience in the world. In Transformative Dimensions of Adult Learning, Dr. Jack Mesereau, the founding father of the theory of transformative learning, attempts to redress the apparent oversight in adult learning theory that has resulted from a failure to recognize the central roles played by an individual's acquired frame of reference through which meaning is construed and all learning takes place. And by the transformation of these habits of expectation during the learning process. From a transformative perspective and in alignment with the constructivist paradigm, meaning is considered to exist within each individual 
and is generated through the interpretation of experiences based on past experience with objects and people in the external world. Mesro maintains that meaning making is central to learning and defines the meaning making process as such. As there are no fixed truths or totally definitive knowledge, and because circumstances change, the human condition must may best be understood as a continuous effort to negotiate contested meanings. That is why it is so important that adult learning emphasize contextual understanding, critical reflection on assumptions, and validating meaning by assessing reasons. The justification for much of what we know and believe, our values and our feelings, depend on the context, bio biographical, historical, cultural, in which they are embedded. We make meaning with different dimensions of awareness and understanding. Mesero defined the transformative learning process as having 10 steps or stages beginning with a disorienting dilemma, then self-examination, then a critical assessment of assumptions, followed by recognition of a connection between one's discontent and the process of transformation, then an exploration of options for new roles, relationships, and action, planning a course of action, then acquiring knowledge and skills for implementing one's plans, a provisional trying of new roles, then building competence and self-confidence in new roles and relationships. And finally, a reintegration into one's life of the basis of conditions dictated by one's new perspective. How does transformational learning occur? What must happen for a person to change their view of the world? Mesro believed that this occurs when people face a disorienting dilemma. Disorienting dilemmas are experiences that don't fit into a person's current beliefs about the world. When faced with a disorienting dilemma, people are forced to reconsider their beliefs in a way that will fit this new experience into the rest of their world view. This often happens through critical reflection in the context of dialogue with other people. Here we must note the link that exists between transformative learning theory and humanitarian action. Both begin with a dilemma. Thus, the trigger for transformative learning is an acute internal and personal crisis or disorienting dilemma. Disorientation occurs when we encounter an experience that does not match our expectations or meaning structures, such as a profound and sudden life experience. However, research has also shown that trigger, triggering events can be both internal and external and may actually be part of a long cumulative process. According to Edward Taylor, transformation may also be triggered by integrating circumstances, such as the search for something that is lacking in an individual's current life, not necessarily always a life-threatening event. In order to delve into practice, I will use the work I did curating the section Dialogues on Humanity, designing the educational methodology and working directly with publics of all ages as part of the project Humanitarian Principles Here and Now. Humanitarian Principles Here and Now is a contemporary art installation produced by the Musée de Lisée and the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs in conversation with the International Committee um, of the Red Cross. The installation is currently traveling around the world. Through art, the project aims to allow people to take time to think, to feel, and to reflect on the humanitarian sphere. For the first section of the installation, a carte blanche was given to 10 Swiss photographers to reflect on and illustrate the humanitarian principles that are central to humanitarian action. For the second uh, section, Dialogues on Humanity, six photographs were selected from the media, each capturing a moment in time with a specific context and story. The aim of this section is to invite visitors to explore their reactions, thoughts and feelings, as well as points of view and personal experiences they're based on. The overall objective of Dialogues on Humanity is to use 
six carefully selected media photographs as a tool to encourage audiences to slow down the process of reading images, to stimulate an inner dialogue through personal reflection, and to inspire visitor participation in discussion, dialogue, and exchange about humanity. The presentation method of the photographs works hand in hand with the educational methodology used to foster transformative learning experiences. To summarize, these are the steps of my methodology for dialogues on humanity. Observation. First, visitors are free to explore the works on display, both looking at the details of the photographs as well as concentrating on their feelings and personal reactions. The images are purposefully displayed without the captions directly next to them in order to encourage critical reflection. The stories behind the images are purposefully displayed in such a way that visitors will consciously look for them after having viewed the installation content, perhaps inspired by curiosity and questions they may have. Not immediately providing the stories is therefore fundamental to the process. During the observation of the images, the individual is often drawn to a photograph, perhaps by a certain element, detail, emotional reaction to the image or a question they may have about it. They connect with it. The observer then begins to think critically, asking questions such as, what am I looking at? And what does this image mean to me? And this can act like a mirror, awakening stories and experiences inside the individual. The transformative learner will then devise the story behind the image according to who they are and what knowledge and experiences they have, and thus construct a personal interpretation. We then introduce an opportunity for dialogue. What each individual sees and how they feel um, about what they see is shared along with the underlying reasons for their interpretation, which often includes a personal story. It is important to note that when an actual educator or mediator is not present for dialogue, this can also be an internal process for the viewer. Within the project, a digital platform is also available for sharing views and entering the conversation. Within the dialogue, the stories behind the images are brought into the conversation. Individuals are then incited to reflect on their original interpretations as well as those of others in relation to the stories behind the images. This is not to demonstrate that their personal interpretation is false. Rather, multiple interpretations exist and are considered valid. Reframing of interpretations may occur or not, depending on individual choice. In Dialogues on Humanity, after the reframing process, we brought in the humanitarian principles into the discussion in alignment with the objective of the project, which was to encourage reflection on humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence, and how they may apply to everyday life. Finally, we moved into the sharing of personal stories. Participants were asked if they would like to share a personal experience from their lives that came to mind when they looked at the image or spoke about it. These stories can also be shared via the project's digital platform. However, it's important to note that in other transformative learning experience I've devised, we moved directly from the reframing process into personal stories. The transformative learning experience proposed in this way encourages visitors to construct meaning based on their prior knowledge, understandings, and experiences, to express their interpretations, points of view, and perspectives, and to reflect on the interpretations of others, then to reassess and reflect once again on their points of view and perspectives. In transformational learning theory, learning occurs in one of four ways. By elaborating existing frames of reference, by learning new frames of reference, by transforming points of view, or by transforming habits of the mind. According to Mesro, the transformational learner will examine his or her own understandings, assumptions, beliefs, and understand the implications of his or her beliefs explore an alternative set of beliefs, meaning scheme, and critically reflect on the validity of these meaning schemes. The objective of this type of experience is to lead the learner to be more open to perspectives other than their own, 
becoming more accepting of alternative viewpoints. According to Edward Taylor, transformation can occur through objective reframing, which is critical reflection on the assumption of others, or subjective reframing, critical reflection, self-reflection on one's own assumptions. Therefore, critical self-reflection is essential to the process of transformative learning. To explain in simple terms, facing new information or dilemmas, the transformative learner will reassess their initial understandings and points of view through critical reflection. They may build upon their past knowledge and understandings or revise them. This process can lead to changes in their perceptions as they integrate new information and new knowledge. In my PhD research, I devised a transformative learning scale to evaluate whether visitors' prior knowledge and understandings have remained the same, been reinforced, enhanced, or changed. The aim was to identify when learning served to significantly modify understandings or shift perspectives. A major shift is seen as perspective transformation. Perspective transformation is a revision of meaning structures from experiences. Meaning structures are the concepts, beliefs, judgments, and feelings that shape an interpretation of information. According to Mesro, the transformation of meaning perspectives leads to a shift in worldview. Thus, through critical reflection on meaning perspectives, individuals can be led to adopt a more inclusive, differentiated, permeable, and integrated perspective. To summarize, Edward Taylor explains that transformative learning, uh, sorry, transformative learning theory, considered a subset of constructivism, serves to explain the learning process of constructing and appropriating new and revised interpretations of the meaning of an experience in the world. The roots of Mesereau's transformational learning theory lie in critical pedagogy and more spe specifically in Paulo Freire's theory of conscientization, which Mesro understands as a critical consciousness leading to a more in-depth comprehension of the world. Why is this important in the humanitarian field? Encouraging visitors' engagement with art focusing on humanitarian themes can serve to alleviate the issue of different distant suffering represented in the media by directly addressing the emotional reaction of the spectator to helplessness or distress. According to Mesero, learning is defined as the process of using a prior interpretation to construe a new or revised interpretation of the meaning of one's experience as a guide to future action. Taylor explains the key to transformational learning is critical reflection on assumptions. Transformative learners can experience objective reframing, subjective reframing, as well as perspective transformation, simply defined as the revision of meaning structures from experiences. Mesero claims that fostering transformative learning experiences can lead the learner to be more open to perspectives other than their own, becoming more accepting of alternative viewpoints. Finally, as the expanded definition of transformative learning proposed by Elizabeth Kazel and Dean Ellis perceives the individual as a part of the human a human system, transformative learning experiences can provide the possibility for an expansion of consciousness in any human system, thus the collective as well as the individual. This expanded consciousness is characterized by new frames of reference, points of view, or habits of the mind, as well as by a new structure for engaging the system's identity. In Castle and Ellis's view, transformation occurs when individuals must modify their personal identities in relation to the identity of the group. 
This allows us to recognize the evolution of both individual and group identities, as well as the effect learning has on group meaning perspectives and culture. Thus, the viewer's engagement in transformative experiences through art can therefore not only promote critical reflection on personal views, as well as the views of others, each individual can also be encouraged to question his or her, or her own role in humanity and to actively engage in bringing about positive change in society as a whole. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon, I am Paola Forgione and I am a humanitarian worker at the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. I must confess to my shame that before joining the ICRC, I considered art as some kind of luxurious hobby, uh, something a little bit snob uh, that was maybe for the elite, but that was definitely very far uh, from the job I had chosen, a job in close contact with the people affected by war and violence and with their very concrete needs. Um, well, I quickly realized that I could not have been more wrong and uh, art erupted um, very rapidly in my life as a humanitarian worker. I still remember my first encounter with uh, artistic expression while I was uh, on mission with uh, the ICRC. I was visiting a prison that uh, had uh, an outstanding record of uh, malnutrition, overcrowding, torture, and I noticed a group of inmates uh, who were very engaged in uh, um, producing, in making some objects. So I got closer to them and I noticed they were uh, transforming some plastic bags, uh, that uh, was pretty much the only item available to them, into little objects for everyday life, like uh, pen cases uh, or uh, uh, little pouches. I can show you a photo that uh, I have taken myself of, uh, of those objects. Um, so I, I, I got I started talking to the inmates and they involved me in their dilemmas about the choice of colors, about the design of the objects. In the beginning, I was a little bit surprised that people with so many other problems um, had found the uh, energy and the interest of uh, making these uh, objects that weren't uh, for selling, uh, the objects were not uh, for paying any services, it was not uh, an uh, initiative from the prison. It was really a spontaneous initiative of uh, this group of inmates, and the objects uh, they were making were just for themselves. Um, but I realized uh, that uh, creating and uh, designing these objects was uh, a coping mechanism for these uh, inmates. In fact, it was uh, essential to their survival in those uh, uh, dehumanizing prisons. Because uh, uh, by creating something new and something beautiful, the uh, inmates wanted to remind uh, everybody 
but themselves first, uh, that in spite of uh, um, the starvation, in spite of torture, in spite of everything they were going through, their inner human being had not been destroyed. Um, they um, were, after all, uh, much more than a bunch of dehabilitated bodies in search uh, for, uh, in need of food and medicines. That moment for me was like an epiphany uh, and I felt like I witnessed, I was witnessing the power of uh, artistic creation. And from that moment on, um, art has always been an essential part of uh, my work and my life as a humanitarian in countries affected by war and violence. Um, in all countries where the ICRC uh, had sent me on a mission, I was uh, um, trying to meet uh, the local artists. Uh, I was trying to see their works, uh, to talk to them, to engage with uh, the local art scene. And this was uh, extremely important to me. Mm. So my days uh, as a humanitarian worker were spent mainly listening to people who had been affected uh, by uh, war, uh, by violence, people who had been displaced, uh, who were injured, who had missed a, a loved one. Uh, my job was to protect their lives and dignity, um, to prevent and to alleviate their suffering. But this suffering for me was really uh, unspeakable, unmeasurable, and uh, uh, very difficult to comprehend, uh, and even more difficult uh, to alleviate. Thankfully, uh, in this uh, journey, I was not alone, and uh, art has always been uh, by my side. Mm, with uh, their uh, creativity, their uh, irony, their unique perspective uh, on uh, uh, mankind, uh, the local artist I met uh, uh, during my missions opened me the doors uh, to their uh, most intimate feelings, uh, their most intimate emotions, uh, their um, fears and their pain, but also their hopes and their dreams not only as individuals, but also as members of the very community that, uh, as a humanitarian worker, I was uh, trying to support. Um, the forms of art that I encountered uh, during my missions are extremely diverse uh, and range from uh, photography to performance, from sculpture to painting. Um, I would like to share with you two of them that have particularly marked uh, my experience um, as a humanitarian worker, but there would be uh, so many more uh, that I would like to, to, to share with you. So the first one, um, is uh, um, an experience I had with a collective of uh, uh, photographers, uh, which I joined when I was on a mission in Central America. These local photographers were meeting every week uh, um, to do photo walks uh, and take photos in the streets of the city center including in the areas of the city uh, center that were known for being uh, very dangerous uh, because of criminality, because of uh, gangs. Um, but this collective of uh, photographers, which is called uh, El Centro Aceclic, uh, was not focusing on um, images, on capturing images of uh, misery, of poverty, on capturing images uh, of uh, violence. They were focusing in uh, uh, capturing uh, the daily life of the many people who, in spite of uh, uh, violence and criminality, uh, go every day in those streets to live and to work. 
and they do it with uh, a lot of uh, simplicity, a lot of uh, humbleness, a lot of dignity, um, and also a lot of uh, resilience. Um, to me, this post, the, the, the images that they were capturing were, uh, looked extremely powerful. Um, but uh, even more powerful was the very action of these photographers of walking in the streets. Uh, as you can see in the photo, uh, the huge line is the line of uh, uh, street photographers from the collective. And uh, maybe walking in the streets can uh, look for us uh, something, uh, for some of us at least, something very normal. Um, but uh, in that context, uh, walking on those streets uh, was uh, like a little revolution, was like a um, statement that in spite of uh, uh, violence, um, this street, uh, uh, the public space, uh, belong to everybody. Um, and so these people, by walking in the streets, uh, were doing, in my perspective, almost a performance uh, uh, to claim back uh, their public space um, in a very um, discreet but also a powerful way. Another example I, of art I encountered in the field that I would like to share with you is uh, from Gaza, from the Gaza Strip, where uh, uh, this artist, Mohamed Abusal, designed a metro line. Now, I don't know if you have ever been uh, to Gaza, but uh, uh, the infrastru infrastructures are actually quite poor. Uh, um, many people uh, commute by donkey, so uh, definitely um, a metro line is not uh, a, a plan that uh, will be realized in the immediate future. But this artist, uh, who is from Gaza, has traveled uh, to other cities and have seen that uh, so many cities uh, have uh, metro lines um, and he thought why can't we think the same for Gaza? Why Gaza can't be a place, a, a, a global uh, place, a, a dynamic, a vibrant uh, place um, like uh, Paris, like London? So he designed this metro line and also he uh, walked around uh, the strip to put this uh, um, um, uh, the signs of them corresponding to the stops uh, that he uh, imagined for uh, this uh, uh, metro line. So this um, project made me think uh, um, on the one hand uh, of uh, uh, how Gaza could be. Uh, and on the other, on how Gaza unfortunately is. So I think uh, it's uh, really um, very striking in making us see uh, this contrast between what uh, this place uh, actually is and what it could be. It allows us uh, to, to dream with, uh, with him. Um, I reflected on uh, uh, the um, um, connections uh, between uh, uh, art and the humanitarian work uh, beside my own personal experience or driving from my own personal experience. Um, and I think uh, there are uh, two important elements. There are two ways uh, how humanitarian workers can benefit uh, from uh, uh, the artists and their perspective. First of all, we are now experiencing a moment where uh, humanitarian organizations are more and more committed in listening uh, to the needs of the communities that they want to help without assuming what these needs are. Uh, the humanitarian organizations are uh, more and more committed in understanding the resilient mechanisms already existing within the communities 
rather than uh, proposing, uh, creating, inventing new uh, resilient mechanisms. So in this process of um, uh, being as close as possible to the communities and its needs and its uh, resilient mechanism, I think that uh, the input uh, that as a humanitarians we can have from the local artist uh, is uh, extremely important. Often in uh, their works, in the works of the artist, um, there is everything we need. Uh, they talk us about uh, their pain, they talk us about uh, uh, their hopes, uh, their dreams, uh, <clears throat> and uh, often their works uh, uh, crystallize not only their hopes, uh, their dreams, uh, their frustration, but the frustration, the hopes, and the dreams of uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people who have uh, endured violence sometimes for years and years and sometimes uh, from generation after generation. All this pain, all these uh, uh, dreams uh, and all these hopes uh, are there, are in the artist works uh, and uh, uh, are talking to, to us, uh, to our ears and to our eyes. And all we have to do as uh, humanitarian workers is uh, listen, I think. A second way how humanitarian workers can benefit from uh, art and artist perspective has to do with uh, uh, our uh, um, job, the day-to-day -day of our job as uh, humanitarians. Um, we spend most of our days uh, uh, exchanging with uh, two groups, uh, uh, dealing with two groups. On the one hand, uh, we talk to the people who have been uh, affected by war and violence, the people who have been displaced, who have been tortured, we try to understand uh, um, what they need and we try to understand what violations uh, uh, they, uh, of uh, humanitarian law they have, been, they have uh, suffered. Um, on the other hand, we talk to the authorities. Uh, we talk to the people who are responsible for the protection of the civilian population. Uh, we engage with political and military leaders, and sometimes uh, these are the very people responsible for the violations. Uh, so the risk uh, when you do this job every day for years and years uh, is uh, that uh, you might end up perceiving the society in which you are working, especially if you are a foreigner, if you come from another country, um, in quite a flat and disconsolate way where uh, um, people are either victims or uh, perpetrators and there's nothing in the middle. So I believe uh, that uh, engaging with the local artists is very important for humanitarians to avoid being trapped uh, in uh, uh, this dichotomic uh, um, perception of society. Uh, for us to be able to see all the many shades, uh, to see all the glimpses and the corners of hope uh, that uh, uh, are sometimes hidden, but uh, that uh, are there, are in uh, those um, societies that uh, where people are uh, living in dehumanizing and degrading uh, conditions and uh, are uh, uh, still trying to think of uh, think about their future. So I think that uh, uh, the artist's perception is really important uh, for us as humanitarians uh, to be able to capture all these uh, uh, glimpses of hope uh, that uh, are uh, existing within the society. Um, Finally, I would like to uh, conclude uh, with uh, a quote uh, from uh, a friend, uh, an artist uh, from uh, Gaza. When I told him about uh, this uh, symposium, I asked him, what do you think is the connection between art and uh, humanity? And he replied to me with uh, this sentence, he told me, art, like fish, does only live in the sea, and humanity is the sea of artists. 
If we review the history of art, we will find many artists who deal with humanitarian issues because uh, they believe that, that life is worth us making a great effort to live it with uh, dignity, peace, and freedom. Uh, so when he told me these words, uh, I realized why my friendship with the artist was so important during all these years uh, uh, I spent in, in the field. Um, I believe that uh, as a humanitarians, uh, we also uh, we also swim in uh, uh, the sea of humanity. And uh, uh, I believe that nobody can swim alone in an ocean of sorrow. So uh, I believe that uh, artists and humanitarians need each other. So I would like to call on you today um, to uh, reflect together um, on how concretely we can uh, bring uh, art uh, and uh, humanitarian world uh, together. I would like uh, the curators, the artists, uh, the other humanitarians participating in this symposium to collectively think uh, on uh, how we can uh, contribute together to a more uh, human world. Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're well. My name is Gilles Fodengler. I'm a poet and a visual artist living between Lausanne, Switzerland, and Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm here to invite you to participate in a collective artwork. I, myself, mainly work with words, text that I write, but also with found text, found words that I hear and read in my daily life. I then turn these sentences into poems to be read. They are also printed on posters or tops, painted or turned into sculptures. I'm interested by writing and retelling what I hear to give it back through art pieces, our everyday words and thoughts, ways of speaking, of thinking, of learning, of evolving. For the ones who are interested to participate, I'm inviting you to share with me on a guest book page some of your notes, comments or feedback on the topics presented today. Changing. And, to be more precise, I have questions. What kind of change did art bring in your life? Are there ways in which art connected your individual experience to the collective one? How? And more generally, what are your thoughts following today's presentations. Thank you. It's pretty simple to participate. You just need to click on this link and you will be directed to a page where you will be able to post your feedback and comments. My proposition is to build with your words a text around the topics of this symposium. The text will be then designed and published in the book following this symposium. Every contributor will be credited or can decide to stay anonymous. Feel free to give your feedback as if it was a guest book, an ID box, a common brainstorming or a complaints office. It can be keywords, critical thoughts, long paragraph, short ones, all is accepted. 
There is also a video uploading option for those who prefer to talk. I am really looking forward to discovering your contribution and working with them. I thank you very much for your participation. I'm wishing you a good afternoon. Thank you. The link below the video is available from now and will stay active until end of June 2021. Hi everyone, my name is Luis Carlos Tovar. I am a visual artist from Bogota, Colombia, currently based in Paris. I am pleased to make a presentation to participate in the colloquium Art and Humanity 2021, organized by the International Red Cross and the Red Crescent Museum. In my opinion, the discussion points rising are fundamental questions in the work in progress of an artist today. I would like to try to address some reflections and questions that came out during the process of my recent projects. I would like to start saying that art cannot be separated from the human. From my point of view, the dialogue between what we consider art and humanity are indivisible. Human activity cannot be understood without art. Art participates in all life situations, Joseph Beuys used to say. As an artist, I am moved by a humanistic vision. I make art as a gesture of resistance and non-acceptance of everyday violence. I try in my projects to create a different space for discussion, and it is in these minimal actions that my artistic practice takes shape.
Brazilian artist Zildo Meireles believes that art has the ability to make microscopic but permanent changes. Tania Bruguera, Cuban artist, says that we must think of art as an implementation of a system and not as a production. Can art be an agent of change? Art is a tool for collective construction and reflection. I have been a visual artist for the last 15 years who has decentralized his practice according to the context. Each project requires different sensibilities and artistic approach. Artistic practices should uh, enable art to be part of the citizens' daily life. Collective creation projects have the power to enlarge the world, to question, to dialogue, or discuss differences. Can art enable us to perform an act of memory? I believe yes, indeed. Memory is a battlefield. It is unstable ground, said Colombian artist Doris Salcedo during the construction of her work called Fragments, a counter monument which floor is made up of the weapons delivered by the FARC after the peace treaty in Colombia some years ago. Uh, memory does not have a single author or an expiration date. Art uh, helps me to perform and question the idea of memory itself. I am particularly interested in post photography and archives. Through them, I can explore the process of creation, of, of otherness, and understand how personal memory shapes collective memory. I would like to share with you all a short video extract uh, based on my last photo book called Jardín de mi Padre, uh, My Father's Garden, published in 2020, thanks to the support of Musée Lycée and Par Parmigiani Fleur, and co-published by RM. El punto de partida de esta reflexión es una fotografía que revela la supervivencia de mi padre durante su secuestro por la guerrilla. La fotografía, una polaroid que se oculta entre los pequeños mitos de mi historia familiar, es un objeto desconocido para mí. El 20 de febrero de 1980, Jaime Tobar, mi padre, fue despojado de su libertad. As an artist, I work with images. Photographs are part of this endless ocean of images. During history, photography has been used to construct truth. Each memory is a construction. Reality is made up of elements of fiction, as well as fiction is built of elements of reality. In this sense, art, photography, helps me in this search for truth. But we must understand that sometimes truth is not enough. The role of art could also be to play with metaphors and symbols, to bring a certain distance. Art is a game, a game to be taken very seriously, said Paul Oster. Personally, I am interested in the metaphor as resilience. Cuenta mi padre que durante los meses de cautiverio, 19 guerrilleros intentaron adoctrinarlo a través de tres libros. El Capital, de Karl Marx, el diario del Che en Bolivia, de Ernesto Guevara, y Qué hacer, de Vladimir Lenin. Todos los días a las 4 de la mañana sucedía el despertar diario y milimétrico. 
le seguía una marcha en la tupida selva húmeda y tropical del Caquetá hacia el siguiente campamento. Solo una vez tuvo la tentación de fugarse. Pero para esos días de abril, mi padre ya estaba enfermo de una flebitis en la pierna derecha. No lo intentó. En cambio, se inventó una manera de recordar a su familia. Cazaba mariposas y recolectaba hojas, flores, semillas de diferentes árboles y plantas que conservaba entre las hojas de los libros revolucionarios. Durante su secuestro, mi padre también recorrió trechos selváticos y presenció paisajes inéditos en su memoria. La región del Caquetá se inicia en el pie del monte andino y termina en los escarpes de Aracuara, adentrándose en la selva amazónica. Erró y contempló una manigua azul y profunda. La describió como una casa donde nunca amanece. I don't believe art has a specific function. We could even say that art is useless, but it is in this uselessness or uncertainty that gives art its great potential to be a bridge for other unthinkable things. Art sometimes helps me to arise problems or give visibility to complex situations, but it can also be a burden. I like what David Lynch said about it. Art does not change anything, it changes you. Indeed, to edit a photographic book on personal memories forces you to edit yourself. El dolor ajeno siempre nos llega de manera abstracta y borrosa. Podemos intuirlo de manera esquiva, imaginarlo sí, pero nunca comprenderlo en su totalidad, nunca habitarlo verdaderamente. Esa imposibilidad se ve simbolizada aquí a través de dos cosas. Que mi padre se haya mostrado tan reacio a conceder la fotografía a prueba de vida y el hecho de que mi trabajo sobre ella se iniciara sin haberla nunca visto. Vulnerability is a sign of existence, said Goethe. There are some projects like Jardín de mi Padre, where the intimate becomes a political gesture. Making this book has been an exercise on how to narrate personal memory versus collective memory. My whole family has participated as other external authors like uh, Cristina Lleras, Joan Foncuberta, Maria Santoyo, and Lydia Dorner. It has not been uh, a book made with only two hands. Each one has contributed in their own way of remembering or assuming memory. The attempt to remember collectively humanizes us. Personal or collective memory exists, but always with fictitious elements in which you relieve elements of the past, your experiences, your culture, your sensibility, Memory is something alive and changing. That idea has led me to other questions. Is there is only personal memory? Is collective memory a fantasy? Is historical critical? And collective memory ideological? Is collective memory the story that people tell about themselves? Autogeographies was born from the necessity to understand the Colombian geography at the Caribbean coast. I started to revisit some of the towns and villages the utopist Elise Reclou described in his book Voyages Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. During the journey, I started to collect a color palette made by a fist of sand from each shore I visit. The triptychs in this project each one correspond to a specific place. The samples of the sand, the ephemeral footprint on the back of the chair and the same chair placed on the landscape. 
looking away from the sea, or are symbols of ways in which the Colombian Caribbean coast was developed. Each chair chosen and photographed belongs to an inhabitant of the sea, fishermen, street vendors, etc. Every place has its own geography and the color of the sand changes from place to place, together with the people of the local customs. Autogeographies records the chair's presence by making drawings and imprints on the beaches along the way. The images represented walking and wandering as aesthetics acts, the country as a witness, and the chair as a pretext. Between 2013 and 2015, I did a series called Call Portraits. This in situ photo essay contained the testimonies of inhabitants in the Caribbean coast within the Colombian Magdalena region. The project explores how the inhabitants of the sea have been affected by the mining conflict experienced in the area. The miners' landing has not only polluted the environment, but also had an impact on the vendors and the fishermen's work. The violation of the rights has been overshadowed by an ecological disaster. This is why these silhouettes tell us and make visible the themes and issues that are drenched with. This are the portraits of four different cooperatives of artisanal fishermen affected in this region. 60 testimonies that give insight on the sea changes are seen from the perception of its inhabitants. The project was possible thanks to the support of the Universidad del Magdalena. This site installation is called Sala de Espera, waiting room. At that time, there was a total denial from the Colombian government regarding the contamination of coal in this area of the Colombian Caribbean. I decided to make this installation composed of five tons of coal purchased from the black market. This in situ installation was exhibited at the Museo de la Universidad del Magdalena in the center of Santa Marta, and was part of my first decentralized project called Autogeografías. Ondu is a visual inventory of over 50,000 photographs taken in 2015 at the Colegio General Santander in Bogota. More than 300 students and teachers used the 1935 school board as a window of sorts in order to write and draw their memory of a school from which they were unjustly displaced in 2018. The reconstruction of their memory through the act of drawing awakens the unconscious and articulates the revaluation of their present moment. When trying to remember the school they had formerly inhabited, a lot of the participants drew a map of the current one as if they past and present had been merged. Definitivamente no 
In using the school board as a mental space, students express and interrogate the idea that surrounds a collective form of memory. This also delves into the problematic that lies in time and identity. Cartography's of scape is the outcome of an artistic residency in Rome on the account of the Ela Photography Prize, established by the Italian and Latin American Institute Ila, and was part of the Festival Internazionale di Roma. Mi chiamo Giao Mohamed del Gambia. I'm from Ghana. I was born in Nigeria. Yo, uh... <laughs> Solo in Afghanistan. Ana, es mi Musa Suleiman. Git min Eritrea. Soy del Marroco. My name is Mohamed Jabi, and I'm from Gambia. I say to myself, you know, I have to cross and go to Italy. Oh no, no puedo tornar en mi país. Prende altro riesgo. Ho entrato del mare per arrivare a Lampedusa. The work intended to invoke both an individual and collective sense of memory. It features refugees of the Baobab shelter who recalled and narrated their journeys, crossings, loses, vicissitudes, and affections, all of which amounted to an ephemeral and emotional record, and also a form of catharsis of the participants. These cartographies of scape emerge from their space of exclusion. Photographs, portraits, testimonies, and sound installations. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and thanks again to the International Red Cross for this uh, invitation. Thanks, uh, Pascal and Pierre Antoine. Hello, uh, this is Katarzyna Grabska, and I'm uh, happy to uh, be here with you. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to share some final reflections on these very rich discussions and exchanges that we've had uh, the pleasure to listen to and take part in over the past uh, four weeks. Um, these points uh, of connect uh, have offered an opportunity to encounter artists, theorists, researchers and humanitarians uh, who reflected on the connection between art and humanity and what are the possibilities. So the participants were asked to respond to some of the key themes uh, that were posed in the call for papers. And some of them, the fundamental beings, uh, can art enable us to grasp with the current humanitarian and conflict related complexities and give them meaning? Um, can works of art that address humanitarian issues help us achieve a more nuanced and concrete understanding of these issues? How can we ensure that representations of these issues betray neither the people that are affected by them nor the situations themselves? And finally, can, uh, what can artistic imagination do when that of a whole people is reduced to ruins? Can the artist play the role of a mediator? And I think the last presentation of um, uh, uh, Luis Tovar, Carlos Tovar, that we've just watched, speaks directly to that issue. In what way an artist offers so many possibilities of um, not being just an artist, but going beyond that in the context of humanitarian settings. So we listen to this presentation that engage consecutively with the following themes. Learning from art, that was um, day one. 
engaging on day two, representation on day three, and today uh, we'll listen to how art is impacting. So day one offered uh, us presentations that focused on what we can learn from art itself. And I remember uh, watching that day and being really impressed by what Ariana Kirk, uh, while she was discussing the exhibition Real Feelings, the artist as visionary, made us think about, made us reflect on the concept of artists as radical agents in the current context of biotech surveillance. Uh, Francesco Tuconi, on the other hand, offered a reflection on using Caravaggio's paintings uh, for humanitarian communication as a metaphor of displacing not only art, but also its use in the humanitarian visual culture and how appropriate or ethically problematic that might be. And then we listened to Olivier Cho, who discussed art uh, that can represent wider issues without uh, producing artwork about genocide um, and at the same time, uh, not opening, reopening the wood and, and producing a spectacle of suffering, but uh, looking at the work of um, Antonio Jazz, how he deals with, uh, uh, with the Rwandan genocide. They too uh, produced a series of very interesting uh, interventions that had to do with engagement. And it offered reflections of engagement and how art and art-based projects in the context of humanitarian settings can play an important role in healing, reconciliation, memorialization, and coming to terms with conflicts and crises. As Sofia Milosevic, Azadeh Sabut, and Elodie Payard all stressed, they stressed the importance of putting the affected individuals and their voices at the center of these art-based projects, whether they are memorialization projects, reconciliations, and healing practices, thus providing an arena for sharing their stories and healing communities. And I think the work of Luis uh, Carlos Tovar spoke to these issues uh, very clearly today as well. This, uh, this approach might uh, just offer a way to go beyond the individual towards the community, a more collective space to memorize otherwise. On day three, we looked at representation. And the key issues discussed on the day were around the problems and problematics of representation, as well as ethics of cultural work. Uh, Dominique, Dominique Lalegue, Marc Herbst, and Isabelle Delacour showed how complex the issues of representations are as related to art and artistic projects. But at the same time, uh, what are also the pitfalls of looking at art as a neutral process? practice that is decontextualized and disconnected from time and place that it actually took place in, especially in the context of human suffering. So they also stress the importance of working from local knowledges, experiences, beyond and against voyeuristic and Western humanitarian gaze that, it's, that has been so problematic in, in the humanitarian uh, practice and in the humanitarian uh, industry, if, if we can say that towards a more co-constructed and community-owned approach to ethical cultural work. And for example, the discussion of using chair as a metaphor that embodies the absence, the invisible people, and at the same time, the social and human connections through the act of remembering collectively was a magnificent example that artists have produced in numerous settings to reflect on, uh, on issues of uh, suffering, of, uh, of uh, violence, of war, without bringing the uh, particular individual um, and without, without producing a particular story. And today on day four, we'll, we engaged with impacting. And the speakers today offered some insights on, uh, first of all, transformative uh, uh, learning, how interaction with art can produce also transformative learning at the more individual uh, level, and then possibly also at the communal level. Um, how that produces both a transformation for less participants in, in, in the art projects. And, and some of it was exposed in the presentation by Luis Carlos Lovar, uh, talking about different projects of memorization, of understanding conflict, of coming from the individual to the collective process of coming to terms with violence, um, conflict, war, disappearance, remembering otherwise. 
they've also reflected, and I think this is the intervention of the humanitarian of uh, Paola, uh, on the way art can also help uh, humanitarians to think differently about the work that they do with their sort of community-based uh, protection approach that has been now promoted in the humanitarian settings. Um, and working, uh, understanding the more uh, art-based community approach and therefore improving humanitarian responses. So in the next few minutes, I wanted to reflect on some of the issues that were raised in these discussions, as well as offer some insights based on my, on my own work as an anthropologist and researcher and a collaborator in, a, in artistic projects. I worked a lot in, in uh, conflict areas and, and with displaced populations and also with artists who live in these situations, but also with artists who work with those issues. Um, artists play a central role in periods of uncertainty and volatility, both as commentators of events and as inspirators for change. So as Bell and Desai argued, the arts are a particularly potent way to activate imagination and a broader understanding of injustice, its consequences and the range of alternative possibilities. In general, art plays a formative role in the constitution of social life, in the ways in which people take responsibility for creating their own histories, for participating in the management of their own social and political realities. And that's a quote from uh, Hebel. Here, I, but I also think the, all the artists and, and uh, researchers and presenters who spoke in this symposium uh, see, engage with art and see art both uh, as political and critical. So that, that's the type of art that, uh, that we are engaging with here in these discussions. Not all art uh, plays this role, even though art is always political. Um, as Müller argues, art is political if it complicates, not simplifies, and if it extends the threat of recognition and understanding beyond what previously was seen and known. These reinterpretations help reveal existing power relations within society, determining what previously was known and what was deemed worthy of creative exploration in the first place, and identifying what previously was not seen and therefore not known including identification of what should be seen or not. So while artists may, uh, may also attempt to contribute to political change very often and work towards uh, social change in the society, uh, they often also uh, work uh, towards, they work in pair with the political authorities and sort of uh, in, in, in the way of um, uh, reconstituting of uh, what it is uh, national, what it is uh, societal, what it is the kind of propaganda, uh, propaganda way uh, of the political regimes. Therefore, we have to see art as something that can work on different spectrums, not only as a panacea for social justice, not all job, art. Uh, refers to the type of social justice that, uh, that is being promoted also through the humanitarian uh, work. Um, critical art, at the same time, as defined by uh, Jacques Rancière, is an art that aims to produce a new perception of the world and therefore create a commitment to its transformation. And I think this is also the art that we are talking about uh, here in this symposium. Some creative practice creates ruptures when it introduces new sensations, ideas, and forms of life to people's perceptions and experiences, broadening the nature of societal and political discourses. For the artist and art to be engaged in transformative processes, the art needs to penetrate the veneer of certainty in a dominant social order, to open up a different way of seeing. And according to Rancière, this is a relational process where the artist, the art, and the audience work out meanings through co-creative practice. So uh, now I'll summarize the three main points offered uh, uh, that I will offer here. Uh, hopefully they will be uh, useful to reflect and refocus our debate on art, artists, and humanitarians or humanity, uh, as we have done over the past four sessions. And first I focus on the role of artists and art in the context of humanitarian settings. So artistic expressions can have a wide range of functions for the individual and for the collectives in society. 
not least during violent conflict and oppression. Artists play a central role in periods of uncertainty and liminality as commentators of events, producers of particular certainties through folklore and propaganda, but also as inspirators for change. Uh, as I said, national governments, uh, they are very happy to use also artists uh, uh, and, and promote certain type of art to, to, to confirm uh, their political uh, goals and, and, and discourses and kind of rebuild ideas of what national culture is and identity. Yet art, and I think all the artists that we've listened to in this symposium, um, the art that they've engaged with, is also a space of for resistance and resilience during the times of repression and conflict and kind of humanitarian settings. And this is where our interest lies, really. Um, as much as these themes of resistance and resilience are complicated and problematic and contested. Creative practice may also provide the space for individual and collective self-expression. And I think that's important to remember. Um, it is, it is that also came the discussion of Paula uh, today, who was talking about different ways of viewing the everyday life in the situation of humanitarian settings. The life continues otherwise. It is not only about crisis and suffering. There are also joys, there are also births, there are also marriages, there's, there's also divorces, there's also uh, celebrations, and there's also crying. So uh, it is important that we also document those moments, and artists are very good at doing that, seeing the, 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 little, the little things of everyday life they make, that make the whole. Uh, so it may be seen as the only space open for resistance in repressive contexts or the best way to bring marginalization and injustice into focus. It can contribute to the process of individual and collective coming to terms with human consequences of violent conflict, displacement, war, genocide, and so on. But it is also Im important to remember that there is this aesthetic nature of art, even in the context of humanitarian settings. And there's also an importance of creating art for its own sake, for the artistic sake. And I think what is interesting to, to note is that um, in, the 60, in the 1960s, in the 1970s, uh, to be called the to, to be uh, an artist who was called a political artist or doing political art was highly problematic. Uh, whereas now for many artists uh, to prove that they just do art is actually highly problematic because highly, highly difficult because very often uh, we tend to um, politicize um, all different types of uh, artistic responses um, in the contemporary art practice. But it is important to remember that in the context of humanitarian settings or, or humanitarian situations, producing beauty through art, it's also a form of uh, living in the conflict. So for example, in, in the context of Sarajevo, um, uh, one of the musicians who played on the ruins uh, uh, of the city, uh, they said, you know, music reminds us that there is life beyond war, humanity beyond degradation, beauty beyond ugliness. Therefore, creative black practice is also for many a way of life in violent conflict and displacement, a way to deal with it, to live through it. Now I turn to point number two, uh, art and artists as transformers, and we talked about it especially, especially today, uh, the kind of impact that they might produce. Um, while art opens many possibilities of knowing, provoking and challenging, uh, its transformative powers, even though they might be quite powerful at the individual level, at the structural level, I think at the societal level, they're much more problematic and overstated. The change doesn't happen only through, uh, through, through art, unfortunately. It has to happen in, in dialogue with other uh, structures of power. And I think this is where the link with humanitarian settings is extremely important with humanitarian organizations that very often have that power to negotiate certain changes uh, in the society. Um, this assumption about artists as transformers and art as transformative uh, also assumes in a certain way that all of us have the same capacity as audience and the same savoir-faire to read art in the same way. What is however powerful about art is 
it's endless possibilities of interpretation. And these interpretations come from the situated knowledge of each of us as a spectator, as an audience, as a reader, as a viewer, as someone who experiences the art, through, seen through the social and cultural frames that shaped our identities and ways of seeing, feeling, and experiencing art. Um, another question is, what type of transformation do we imagine when we talk about art as a transform transformative potential? Artistic practices has a great potential to relate to space and time and transform them both. But how to transform uh, the structures of power that actually very often are the causes of, uh, of humanitarian uh, suffering, of humanitarian crisis, of conflicts and so on. So that, that cannot, I argue that that has to be, there has to be another step to it. So just to, uh, um, go to point number three, which is the link between humanitarianism and art, but also the, the danger of using art and the danger of representation in the humanitarian context. So we see between humanitarianism and this critical and political art that we've talked about, they both deal with human values, with issues that refer to humanity, with universal values that relate to what humanity is. And in this way, the two are linked as having often at its core humanity rather than individual dimension. Art and humanitarians are at the same time both also not neutral. They are both political fields and take place within concrete political contexts. They are also influenced and thus transformed by these complex contexts. Therefore, while some artists might be radical agents for change, they are far from floating agents. I think uh, um, uh, Anika Khan uh, talked about this kind of possibility of artists as floating uh, apolitical and having this total freedom. But the reality of it is that their art is also produced in these very concrete settings that are driven by money, by politics, by economic interests, uh, uh, by influence, by privilege. Third point, the link between humanitarianism and art, both art and humanitarianism have to do with representation and the complexities of this. And we've discussed it at length. Who has a voice to speak on behalf of whom? Who can represent whom and in what way? And both contemporary art and humanitarianism have opened up the participatory processes and practices, community-based protection, for example, or participatory art projects, co-creation of cultural work to overcome some of the perils of representation. But I think there is more uh, that we can learn uh, especially from the artistic uh, practice of doing this. So some dangers in using art in humanitarian settings as our contributors to this symposium warned us. And I think we have to keep them in mind when we talk about the possibilities. Um, humanitarian contexts have responded to great potential of art as a healing tool. However, uh, this is a sort of a reductionist and utilitarian view of art and using it in, in, uh, in a given context as a remedy. So we have to think wider than that. Art is not only for, for healing, but it has all these other uh, aspects of creative imagination and knowing otherwise. So while there is a need to rethink the role of arts in addressing and representing humanitarian disaster, the challenges and obstacles facing the work of art in humanitarian contexts and the role of art in contributing to the long-term process of transforming relationships, healing wounds, seeking justice, and fostering human flourishing need to be carefully considered. Often art and artists in humanitarian settings or in those in conflict situations who have faced oppression and violence, see art as a way to exist, a way to stay alive, a way to stay hum human in such extremely dehumanizing conditions. And for me, I think what, this, um, what it shows is this call of artists and art, and I would stress that as the quest for ethics of recognition through artistic practice. Um, Therefore, there is a need for this ethical response that recognizes the subjects that are narrating these accounts. The ethical response that comes from the humanitarian setting, but also from the humanitarian organizations, but also those uh, in positions of power that are causing uh, such humanitarian disasters. So to conclude, what are the possibilities? 
what are the points of reflection and refocusing. As one of the contributors to the symposium said, art is seen very often as non-essential, but therefore is essential. And the power of art to capture the otherwise invisible, to imagine the impossible, and to, to, to really uh, live in the humanity, in the sea of humanity, as Paula said, and as Luis Carlos Tovar also emphasized in his talk uh, today, that art cannot be separated from humanity. Art can offer a room for reflection and refocusing of ideas, ways of being and connecting particular events to wider moral and societal values and norms. It is a way to comment on the society and offers a critical stance. It opens up a space of knowing otherwise through different senses, not only through the sight. And this is sort of against the enlightenment uh, debate of uh, artists as visionaries. But in terms of, uh, uh, going beyond the vision, uh, work that engages a multiplicity of senses, not just sight, including all the five senses to trigger our intuition, our minds, our imaginations. This can offer a different way of knowing and a different way of addressing issues related to human tiredness. In this way, art can potentially offer what, uh, what in today's presentation, Aspen uh, Uhrer called transformative learning. Again, this transformative learning does not take place in the apolitical uh, situation. Um, and art is not an apolitical solution uh, in itself. Uh, and therefore artists should not be seen as the substitutes of humanitarian workers. Their role in the society in many ways is very different than that of artists. Neither art nor humanitarian work work are apolitical, as we said, and they take place in concrete settings and contexts. But these contexts need to be considered when the transformative learning is taken from the individual to the societal and then um, structural levels. Yet art has a role in the society, but it cannot substitute the role of the state, responsibilities towards the elevation of suffering and resolution of conflicts. And it should neither be seen as a tool to achieve that, in this way, we risk to strip, in a sense, the, the, on the one hand, the artists from their own sense of creative selves and put a large burden on them in res resolving these very complicated issues. Um, but also uh, reduce the opportunities that we have uh, in wider possibilities of interpretation in artistic work, in wider possibilities of imagining. So I think what is key is uh, how through art and, and, and linking it to the humanitarian settings, we can produce, engage, we can engage otherwise, learn otherwise, remember otherwise, imagine otherwise, and potentially lead to a change. A change that, the change that has to come in a dialogue uh, between artists and humanitarians, but also uh, also the, the authorities and, and wider societal institutions. Um, it has to come also from the co-production of knowledge and, this, and the great potential uh, to offer a different type of reading, feeling, experiencing art, not only to open the wounds, but also uh, how to go beyond um, visual representation of suffering. To imagine alternatives, I think that's a great potential of art for humanitarians. But it is also linked to the responsibility of humanitarian organizations, as well as the states, that cannot be replaced by the artistic practice. So I'll finish here, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the live uh, section of our symposium, the fourth session, Art and Humanity, What is Possible? Um, we've had a fantastic session today with really outstanding speakers whom I'm very happy to welcome this evening, Afshan Hoya, 
Paola Forgione, Luis Carlos Tovar, and Katarzyna Grabska. I'm also happy to uh, say hello to my colleagues, Philippe Stoll and Julie Enkel Juliard. So today's theme was um, impacting. I can only say that it has had a huge impact on me to listen to you and to, to appreciate the diversity of your experiences and points of view. Um, I would like to open up a conversation with all of you really on, on different um, points I had in mind uh, during the different presentations. And I would really like to thank you, uh, Katarzyna, for giving such a very clear and uh, detailed overview of our conversation so far. One uh, theme I'd like to um, just throw out there and let you approach it as you wish is the question of, of safe space and context. We've talked a lot about uh, the transformative um, aspects of art, how it can trigger change or how it can change you and uh, what are the limits of this concept. I would be curious to hear you uh, on this idea of the space or the context required for uh, such a transformative experience to occur. Um, and I guess the second point uh, related to this and which I invite you to approach is the question of vulnerability. Um, I'm thinking a lot about this theme in, in my profession as a museum director. And I, I think there is such incredible power in acknowledging vulner vulnerability. And I'm, I'm thinking about this uh, of course, in the context of transformative learning, but also in the context of uh, your work, uh, Paola, in the field, uh, if it's regarding the people you're connected with or your own vulnerability. And also, of course, Luis Carlos uh, sharing your vulnerability uh, with a very broad audience. So these two aspects, the safe space had we created and the question of vulnerability in, in this process. I don't know who would like to start. Of course, Ashan, I'm looking at you, but... <laughs> Actually, I was going to say me, if that's okay. Ah, good. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for actually asking that question, because there were two things I wanted to bring up that I didn't bring up in my talk. And I think they can be very much linked to safe space and vulnerability. The first thing is um, for transformation and perspective transformation to happen is uh, the importance of actually confronting misconceptions. And this conf confrontation can actually lead to subjective reframing, which can then lead to perspective transformation. Um, in order to do this, first of all, you obviously have to be in a safe space, um, in a space where people feel comfortable um, expressing themselves or confronting their own within themselves, individually their own um, views. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was the importance of negative emotions. Um, in the, when information or when, for instance, you're being confronted with a misconception you possibly had and you're trying to reassess, well, what is it I really think now? Um, what is my view, my perception now? You have to go into that vulnerable space and then the negative emotions will come up. So the safe space is essential and there are different ways to make a safe space. Um, I focus very much on um, uh, taking away hierarchy and authority. Mm -hmm. That's often my way of um, creating a safe space and um, making sure that everyone gets heard and everyone is allowed to be equal um, and non-judgmental as well. Mm -hmm. So Luis Carlos and, and Paola, how, how do you uh, create this safe space in, in your practice? How, how do you think of that? Maybe Luis Carlos, I see you have your mic on. Um... No, for me, for me, uh, really, it was by total accident. I mm -hmm. think you, you have uh, all this sensibility when you work in art, you have, you are like, uh, you're open to, to hear the other. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is the first step to, to begin, to begin to, to understand, uh, to hear the other, but at the same time, you're hearing yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's like, a, it's, it's always like a, an exchange. 
and the vulnerability is to put you in this in this uh, abyssum where you have your own fears and and you you have the you are seeing and hearing the fear of the other so it's it's a complex situation uh, and for me it's, it's like um it's a, it's a very confusing situation because you cannot compare a doctor if you talk about humanitarian and uh, uh, humanist. So what is the difference between both and how you can uh, like a difference between preserving life is first, uh -huh. then, then is is another issue, no? So, uh -huh. so uh, for me as an artist, is is uh, we work more in in the metaphor and in the um, um, we use language as a as a possible tool to to resolve this this uh, or to talk about this vulnerability, but it's. It's uh, mm -hmm. quite different. I don't know how to... Well, I'll, I'll take it from there, Luis Carlos, and I'll turn to, to Paola and to Philip as well, because um, in your presentation, Paola, you, you were talking uh, in, in a kind of simultaneous way of these two moments, uh, preserving and saving life and uh, creating... Um, I'd be curious to, to hear you more on, on this topic because it was fascinating to me how you were very humble in a certain way to, to express that humanitarian workers need artists and, and perhaps you can elaborate on that. Yes, definitely. Um, so I feel that often people perceive humanitarian workers as uh, heroes, uh, um, as very strong people, but in fact, uh, we are not machines. Uh, so when you are in the field, you are often overwhelmed uh, with the frustration, with sadness, with anger, because of what you see around you, but also because of the some circumstances of, of your life. Maybe you are far from your family. And so you, you, you are in a situation where you are very, very vulnerable. And for me, it was precisely this vulnerability that created this inside space for art to come into my life. Hadn't I had that vulnerability, maybe I wouldn't have found that space. I wouldn't have had that need um, to listen to the artist, uh, to uh, learn from them, to find in them answers that I couldn't find in uh, my briefings, uh, you know? And so for me, it was uh, uh, really also by accident that this experience, uh, that, that art came into, into my life, but um, this vulnerability and uh, the presence of art in my life was actually an opportunity of, I would say, even personal growth uh, in my life as a humanitarian. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'll also look to, to you, Philip, now, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to your perspective on this. And I do know you also have a question for Paula, so I'll, I'll hand over the floor to you. Well, I, I don't have much to add. I think uh, uh, what Paula described is something that... Uh, I totally relate and uh, I don't need to add anything, but but maybe also uh, uh, I think art has this value, which is also life-saving in a way. It's maybe not uh, from a medical perspective, but from a, a sanity perspective. And, and we know that in situations where, and this has been explained over the past sessions that, you know, moving on the verge of um, becoming and, and not being capable to live through a, a difficult situation is, is very thin and, and art is there to, to help you to, to stay on your feet and, and to, or to carry on or to, to, to see some, some ray of hope or way to express yourself. So, and I think uh, this is, I think a, a field of, of, um, 
of work that we need to further dig and continue. And, and we have been discussing already to how to, to go from this first symposium to something different. And maybe that's that's the link I can, I can uh, make to the question I have for Paola. When you were in the field, what was the missing elements for you to to further explore that that interaction or that now you are you have gone through this this symposium this reflection are there things that you have that you you think that were missing and maybe this question can be also for artists what is missing for a better collaboration because this will feed us um uh, Julie, uh, uh, Pascal, and myself to 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 continue to carry on on this reflection on on bring better the 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 the, the these two world together. Thank you. That is a very good question. I think uh, that I felt very lonely in the field uh, in my interest uh, for art. Uh, it was like my extravagant hobby and so my colleagues uh, were perceiving it as uh, yeah you know she she's into art it's a bit funny but <laughs> they didn't see the relationship uh, that we, we we are all talking about today um, so I developed this interest uh, um, quite quite lonely and then uh, through the years I met Pascal, I met you Philip and I felt uh, like an institutional framework in my engagement with art and this has also made me feel confident in a sense like what I was feeling it actually makes sense there is actually a connection between humanitarians and uh, humanitarian world and art it was not my feeling mm, it I like to be to think that uh, we are together in this process uh, of uh, thinking how art and uh, uh, the humanitarian world can work together. So I really welcome um, activities, roundtables, experiences like the one that uh, that you you have organized uh, with uh, um, with with external partners to the ICRC. Um, well, thank yeah. you for that. I will definitely continue. And and Luis Carlos in the. In the many uh, social questions that you have addressed in your work, uh, in your home country, but also abroad, uh, you've surely had uh, numerous occasions to work with humanitarian workers or to interact with humanitarian workers. From your perspective, um, what was missing in this relationship or, or how do you feel humanitarian workers saw you uh, as an artist contributing to a more complex situation. How do you see your relationship with humanitarian workers as an artist? Uh, for me, as, as I said, uh, I, I was um, very curious about and, and, and the, I saw the importance to work uh, uh, at that moment in, in Italy with the, the crisis of the, of the refugees in 2014, 2015. And also uh, in Colombia, I work with uh, displaced uh, people, and for me, it has been uh, very quite a challenge to to hear all the and, and to work with them because I I didn't, uh, as I said, it was like a, um, uh, yes. Um, I don't know how to explain this. I'm, I'm sorry. That's it's, okay. Uh, <laughs> no, just... Uh, it doesn't some, come... Some, yeah. No, um, for me, um, artists are sensitive to all kinds of situations. And the place you go, you, you get involved into, into the context. And... Uh, but... For me, in a personal point of view, I, I, uh, I believe the humanitarian action is uh, beyond art in itself. Mm -hmm. I cannot compare the work of an artist compared to a doctor that wants to preserve life. Sure. So, so in, this, in, this, uh, um, in this context, for me, art is just uh, a tool we, we can be a tool to, 
to help in this um, in this uh -huh. because art art uh, can be knowledge but before it's communication so we can really create like a like a uh, link and a, and a communication process uh, in a situation in a very difficult situation and uh, I started in this because I wanted to decentralize mm -hmm. as a human being but also as an artist to decentralize myself in, in these situations and and uh, it totally changed my my point of view of of my work of of the way I I, I I did art before, and uh, I think that's a clue in this in this conversation to decentralize meaning, uh, as uh, in the first um, uh, conversation with uh, Afshan, she was talking about the the human condition, may understood, but negotiating this. Um, uh, the realization of, of meanings and, and this this is very important. We have to decentralize ourselves and the meaning of things uh, and to expand expand this idea of even what it's art. It's a very confusing word and sometimes mm -hmm. problematic, you know so so these, these, these borders have to be sometimes just uh, uh, we, we go beyond. The, the mm -hmm. meaning of this. And you had this beautiful quote, art does not change anything, it changes you, uh, which is a very good reminder in, in this conversation. And certainly adopting a, a multidisciplinary approach is um, it couldn't be more relevant in, in this conversation. I'd like to uh, ask you, Katarzyna, if you are um, still with us. I think you are. Yeah. You are, wonderful. I have a question for you. Um, you were um, you were explaining very clearly and, and in a very relevant way how art basically is not enough, and uh, mm. even if it might have a transformative uh, power, we have to look at the broader picture and uh, the bigger and overwhelming structures of society altogether and how they connect. I would be just curious uh, to ask you how you see the museum. Uh, in this conversation, what potential do you associate with the museum? And I perhaps might also ask this question on behalf of Julie, who's representing here the Art and Design University in Geneva. How do you see schools and, and training centers in this conversation? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's another very relevant, uh, relevant question to this discussion, because as we said, it's, uh, it cannot really stop at the level of uh, mm -hmm. individual experiences. And I think it would also undermine the potential that both uh, fields have for this. Um, I think the museums, and we've had these discussions uh, with you, Pascal, directly in relation to other uh, projects, uh, the museums play a very important role because they are these sites of knowledge, of presumed knowledge, right? mm. this authoritarian knowledge. Uh, and they produce a certain representation. And I think thinking about museums, any kind of museums, but then thinking specifically about a museum like the Museum of the Red Crescent and the Red Crescent, you have an amazing power to actually shape the debate, shape the discussion. So by opening up um, um, uh, the possible ways that interpretation uh, of what is in the museum uh, uh, and what is displayed in the museum, how it is displayed, how it is communicated, who comes to the museum, who has the right to voice their opinion. I think it's key. And, and this, again, I think that goes back to the point that uh, uh, Luis uh, uh, Carlos just made about decentralizing. It's also about decentralizing what we think about, you know, what museum expertise is and, and, and who produces that expertise. Uh, and I think for a very long time, uh, you know, thinking about the Museum of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, I, I always had this uh, imagination of a museum where there's the, a lot of the humanitarian workers perspective in it. Um, uh, whereas uh, bringing other perspectives doesn't mean that, uh, doesn't mean that the humanitarian perspective is uh, not relevant. In fact, it's exactly the opposite, opening up to multiple 
ways of reading the ex exhibition. And, and this is what I also uh, talked about uh, a little bit in the concluding remarks. I think as viewers, uh, each of us has such very different experiences, very different situated knowledges. So how we read art, how I read what, for example, uh, uh, um, you know, for example, the exhibition of uh, Luis Carlos presents comes also from my own personal uh, experiences. I read it through that. Uh, that also relates to the point of transformative learning that, um, uh, that, uh, that Aspan mentioned. So I think the museums have a tremendous potential to shape the larger debates uh, right. and to make the debates more collective you know, and, and more institutional. And that also relates to the universities. Um, there has been now a trend of, of having these uh, studies that relate to art as social, uh, you know, for social justice um, and kind of opening up this debate. And I think that's very, very useful. Um, but I think we have to, again, go a little bit. We cannot only stop in these debates. That has to be a link to, and I think that also happens uh, um, uh, slowly in the university in, uh, in Geneva where you connecting these art projects to real life situations, but not only to real life experiences, but also to the institutions that then uh, have a power over these lives. So, uh, so bringing into conversation, I think the universities have power to do that. You know, universities are seen as political, as apolitical, though they are highly political, but, uh, but they have the power to bring uh, different, uh, different institutions, different individuals, individuals in power into the conversation and, uh, and, and bring this more bottom-up knowledge, this kind of community-based knowledge uh, to wider discussions. And I think that's a forum that uh, that has to be used. And, and we have to be also brave to use it because these are not easy discussions. Mm. And we go against the political, the political discourse, right? Well, let's be brave and let's use it. And let's see this as, as the beginning of a conversation. Um, we will end this first conversation here and definitely look forward to continuing to explore these connections between art and humanitarian action in, in other shapes and formats. Um, we are planning a publication uh, to conclude this uh, international symposium. And I would really like to thank now uh, my partners in crime, uh, Philippe Stoll and Julien Kelljulia, with whom we've had the most fascinating debates and a wonderful collaborative experience that brought us here today. So thank you so much. Thank you also to Pierre-Antoine Poussin, um, who did a great job at producing and coordinating the entire symposium. It wasn't an easy thing to do, so thank you to him. And thank you also to Cecilia Suarez, who recently joined the team and who's been tweeting, reposting, sharing uh, knowledge nuggets that have come out of this wonderful conversation. So thank you again to all our speakers today and uh, I can only say see you soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, thank you.